Well, as a tribute to my father after he died, I decided that maybe I should bring the characters into a realm that he hadn't taken them. And one of my primary things was new production, primarily in the motion picture arena. I really didn't want to compete terribly with him in the television arena. That He did that so perfectly. So that was one of my um, decisions to go ahead and, and do motion pictures. We had to clear up some legal rights, so it took a number of years. But we've been working on the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie since about 1992. It was really Jane Rosenthal who was uh, the one who put it all together and worked for a long time, like many years, to get the thing started and going and everybody involved. Jane Rosenthal of Tribeca Productions, Robert De Niro's partner, came to me in 1992 and suggested we work on a movie together. And we tossed around a, a zillion different ideas, but keeping the characters true to what they were on television was the most important thing. When I went into uh, the Dudley Do-Right Emporium five years ago, uh, it was really that um, I thought that, it, that Rocky and Bolingo could be a live action animated movie. And that was really it. It was, um, you know, I didn't really have a story, but it was taking these, these characters uh, from the 60s and putting them into, you know, the real contemporary world. We also had to address what happened to Boris and Natasha now that the Cold War was over, and what were they going to do in the 90s? And Rocky and Bullwinkle we last saw in 1964. So what have they been doing in the last, you know, 35 years? Not done. The way Fearless Leader and Boris and Natasha actually get uh, into the real world. They go to Minnie Mogul's office at Phony Pictures International and get her to sign a contract for acquiring the rights to the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. And when she reaches into the television to sign the contract, uh, Fearless Leader refuses to let go. Um, when she yanks to get the contract out, she pulls the cartoon villains out of the television. The basic idea is that Boris and Natasha uh, and uh, come to America with fearless leader. Once the Iron Curtain falls, uh, he realizes that the next logical step for him is to become a media mogul, and that that's the kind of, perhaps, you know, that that's the best place for an Eastern European dictator to go. Uh, so uh, they, they plan to, in fact, buy up all of the cable television in America uh, to start a network called RBTV, or Really Bad Television. There are people out there that get Rocky and Bullwinkle that are absolutely passionate about these characters, and Des was one of those. He felt that passion, and in his pitches to us on his directoral notes and stuff, he definitely got it. And I'd say that was, without a doubt, his best-selling feature. I always look for the passion in people that they get Rocky and Bullwinkle. They either have it or they don't. Rocky and Bullwinkle remain uh, as animated uh, characters throughout, uh, and uh, they arrive uh, in a different manner. Uh, uh, Karen Sympathy, the, the head of the, F the, the girl, the F our FBI girl who brings them out of syndication so they can help stop Fearless Leader, uh, she actually green lights them, uh, and there's literally a you know 80 foot green light that she turns on. And, the, the beam of light sucks them up and delivers them to Hollywood. So they remain cartoons the whole time. This was a key element, certainly to me, is how are Rocky and Bullwinkle going to look now that there's all this new technology? We've always seen them as 2D characters. And so we've actually created what we call 2.5D. Rather than go to the full 3D, we want them to look very much like they did in the animated show, but we want to give them dimension. So we've come up with this term 2.5D, and they look you know, they look slightly different only because they've got dimension now. The basic difference between the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie and, let's say, Space Jam is that our characters are created digitally. And because of that, we can create the illusion that they occupy three-dimensional space. We don't want to lose the essence of the characters, and so it, it is really a fine balance of, of what we're trying to do. Um, and of course, people's, people's uh, are so much more sophisticated. They're, they're used to looking at 
much more um, complex kinds of animation these days. But the original was a fairly limited animation, and it had a particular look to it. And we, and as I said, that you know, there's a charm. There's still a charm to it. But what we'd like to do is, you know, bring it, bring it into the real world. You know, the characters are coming out into the real world. So there's there's certain things that I think we'll do that will definitely add to the to the integration ability of the characters themselves. They'll be much more dimensional. They'll cast shadows. They'll interact with the real world, much, you know, which they haven't done as far as I'm aware before. You really have to learn to project the characters into the scene. You know, we can we have puppets that we can drop in to look at. We have reference shots, you know, uh, that, that that show us Rocky and Bullwinkle. We have the ability digitally right on the set to drop in an image of the characters just to check eyeline and that sort of thing. Of course, we go through the storyboards and then um, and then we work with puppets and then a lot of times um, the ILM guys will stand in. Um, for Rocky and Bullwinkle and, and act out the scene with me, you know, especially if Rocky and Bullwinkle are off camera and we're doing a scene. And they rehearse with me a lot of times and, and walk around like Bullwinkle and, and talk like him. And then, uh, and then once we've done it a bunch of times, we just take everything away and do it with nothing. The great advantage in this, you know, being able to render them digitally is that, that when Karen's sympathy looks into Bullwinkle's eyes, you'll really believe that she's looking in his eyes. Karen Sympathy is an idealist in an age where idealism isn't very fashionable and uh, perhaps not always even that practical. And she comes face to face with her childhood heroes and has to confront herself in a sense. And it's one of those classic you know, battles uh, between heart and mind. You know, her heart is constantly telling her what's right and wants to do what's right and that's her urge and her impulse but her head which is of course the, the the mind of an FBI agent is telling her that that's wrong and she has to be hard-nosed and ruthless and you know and and so on out that uh, needless to say her, her heart does win out and it's because of her heart that she's ultimately you know successful but she really struggles with that and a lot of that's actually you know, I think extremely funny to watch her go through uh, the, you know, the, to watch her agonize over you know all of this, and to have this little squirrel as her conscience. She is um, warm-hearted and idealistic, and wants to you know save the world. But um, she thinks that that's not what an FBI agent is supposed to be like. So she tries very hard to be gruff and unemotional and mean, and um, you know tries and uh, save people FBI way, very harsh. But she's. <clears throat> Not very good at it. I really have high hopes that America's gonna fall in love with this girl. I mean, I, you know, when she walked in and auditioned, for, as a director, it's the kind of moment you wait for. Because if I'm right, you know, it's something I'll remember all my life. You know, that, that I, I happened to be there when she, you know, she did, did her first screen test. And, um, you know, I think she's gonna bring, I think one of the surprising things about Rocky and Bullwinkle is that it's, it's, it, Extremely funny, as you would expect, uh, but it has heart. Listen, idiot! When Jane came to approach me the first time, she said that Bob was possibly interested in playing Boris. Now, our family history was such that we laughed all the time, and I really just burst out in hysterics thinking what my father would think about Robert De Niro, this premier dramatic actor, wanting to play his character Boris. I thought it was fabulous. He always thought it could be you know, fun to do that kind of caricature, cartoon-like uh, uh, role. So we always, you know, I, I guess it was always in our in our mind that he could do Fearless Leader. Jane had suggested that 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 uh, Mr. De Niro might be willing to play Fearless Leader, which of course was, you know, that falls under that category of when do I wake up? You know, having Robert De Niro as Fearless Leader. Bob wanted to test all kinds of things, so he went through. You know, he went through a very extensive process in, you know, testing the look of his hair, the nose, the ears, eyeglasses. Um, you know, the whole the whole wardrobe. Marlene Stewart was fantastic in working with us on that. But I see kids on the street with that kind of look, and I knew that you know, I, I'd, I'd have some allies out there. Are you talking to me? I was intimidated by De Niro when I first walked on the, the set. And I'm not intimidated by too many people. And I didn't think I was going to be at all. 
but he's just got this presence. I don't know exactly. I can't put my finger on it, but I, he made me nervous. Uh, I've had some experience with material like this. I don't know that he ever has. So for him, it was a whole new world, and I think it, it required more effort to be silly. Um, I can be silly at the drop of a hat. I had fun doing it. Cartoons are good. They're clever and smart, witty. It's been great watching him work and also, you know, just discussing the process with him. I think he's helped me uh, uh, in, in terms of, the, you know, our work together and also with the other actors. In terms of Renee and Natasha, you know, there were some obvious choices. She was the she wasn't the, the most obvious choice, but somebody who, when Kenny and I were working on the script for a number of years, we had always envisioned Renee actually in the role of Karen's sympathy. Um, it was just always something that we kept saying, oh, that's, the, that's Renee Russo's part. So Kenny and I had always envisioned Renee in this movie in some way, and um, when it came up that she was available and interested in doing, in doing Natasha, it was, you know, a real obvious choice for us. Being zomb zombified from uh, bad television. <laughs> I thought that it was great. So I loved the script. It was an intelligent comedy, and I loved that. And, and the first thing I thought about was Natasha and her clothes, hair, and makeup. <laughs> I just thought it was a, a great opportunity to look different. I really wasn't sure whether it would be something that interested her or, you know, whether it would be something that would, would be, uh, you know, whether the glove would fit. Neatly, but I went to meet her uh, in, uh, flew back to, to New York and drove out to meet her. She was on, a, on another set. And uh, it became really clear that she was really passionate about, about playing uh, Natasha Fatal. I walk in the door and there's June Foray and she's, she did the original voice of Natasha. And I thought, oh good, they have June Foray here to make me look like an idiot. <laughs> I was so self-conscious that I just said, um, June, could you read a couple lines for me? And she did. Oh, she was so wonderful. But she was gra so gracious. And so I was pretty nervous the first time. Well, darling, we will do what we can do. That's all. Awful. Well, when you sort of looked around, there were just a handful of people that you could really say could emulate uh, Boris in, you know, in a real specific way. And Jason was, you know, was, was really our first choice. Jason has said himself that he's, you know, and, and it's true that he's just, you know, born to play Boris Badenov, you know, he, and, and it's true, he just is. Stop! You're embarrassing me. The voice of Boris, I, I have to doff my hat to Jay Ward for coming up with it. We're just trying as best we can to get you know, back down to that beautiful sound that he had. Um, the body movement, th there's um, a, a wonderful coach, uh, Lynn Hockney, who's, who works with us, but everybody's at a disadvantage because the, the cartoon was done um, so inexpensively that basically the only thing that moved was arms and mouths. That was it. So you, you never saw Boris and Natasha. You saw them run very quickly, but you never saw them walk. So we're guessing, and uh, you know, the only thing I could think of was that Boris always stands with his feet turned out. So starting from there, I said, well, if he stands like that, maybe he walks like that, and if he walks like that, well, then maybe he walks like this. And um, and then another part of it just came from always trying. I mean, I am much shorter than Renee, but always trying to even shorten it more. I kind of got into that slouch thing, and and then I thought, you know, he <laughs> he might be very paranoid about the real world. So this whole kind of what, what's going on, you know, can I trust anyone kind of thing started to happen. And it, it all just kind of <laughs> happened and, it, it, it together, you know, you, you find it on its feet. You know, Jason's just so easy to work with. He really is because he's so responsive. So if I do something that's an improv, he, he's just like right there. And actually, I'm not as good as he is. So if he improvs, usually I can, you know, I'm not as fast as he is, but usually I can pretty much keep up with him. But I think he makes it easy to work with him. When I first came in to talk to the studio about the movie before I had the job, one of my suggestions was, you know, let's do a whole series of cameos. I don't like moose pictures. And the thing is that one actor attracts another, you know what I mean? So, so you, be, before too long, we had a kind of head of steam going. This truck matches the description of a vehicle reported stolen outside Red Bay, Oklahoma, just a couple hours ago. We've ended up with, you know, Whoopi Goldberg, John Goodman, Billy Crystal, 
Keenan and Cal, who were my first impulse for these two What's the Matter You uh, college students. What's the it was just great for the crew because, you know, it's, it's such a lift, you know, when, you, when you're on these difficult schedules that suddenly you have Jonathan Winters there. Keep your hands high above your head. It's great to sort of inject that energy into the, into the production. We gotta get out of here fast. Quick, let's go to a commercial. In a way, I think Rocky and Bullwinkle, as, as ludicrous as this might sound, it kind of speaks to our time, you know, and you're, and even, even with a comedy, you know, you want some kind of underpinning that, uh, that makes you feel like what you're doing is, is, is worthwhile. And, you know, we parachute these two little pop icons from the Cold War into our own age, and they really have something to show us. I don't think Bullwinkle ever fully understands what the story of the movie's about. You know, he's focused on saving the animated forest in Frostbite Falls, and as far as he's concerned, that's what the movie's about. But on the other hand, you know, Bullwinkle has uh, a very close relationship with Rocky, and things happen to him. So Bullwinkle definitely goes through his, you know, vulnerable periods, which which isn't exactly the same as a character arc, but it's, you know, I suppose experiential nonetheless. Where's Bullwinkle? You know, Rocky's lost a certain amount of faith, you know, in himself because he hasn't been flying, and uh, you know, I think maybe mirroring the feelings in our own times a little bit, tongue in cheek, of course, but. And uh, when he discovers, when he can fly again, he's able to kind of transfer, I suppose, that self-belief and confidence and, and uh, again, idealism uh, to Karen. They get, it gets a little frustrating for her, I think, sometimes because, you know, like in the scene today, there's this huge car accident and she's all bruised and scraped and, you know, trying to hold it together. And they're fine, you know, they're cartoon characters, so they never get hurt and they're always happy and they're always cracking these lame jokes when she's trying to, you know, be serious and, and not have any fun and they're always happy and she's, uh, she wants to be tough and stern and they're always kind of being funny. You know, it's like, like you know, I think like all uh, hopefully good comedy, uh, there's always some kind of serious, you know, underpinning. I think you can actually take your kids to this with you, with, you know, real pride. Say, I remember these cartoons when I was a kid. I think if you're a kid, you can actually take your parents to it without fear that they're going to be, you know, without any fear that they're going to be, you know, bored. Or, and I, I think teens are going to love it. I think teens are going to love Piper. I know teenage boys are going to love Piper. <laughs> so I have, I have real hopes for this thing. And I think that well-written comedy is going to hit, you know, an adult if not more strongly than a child. I think, um, you know, a lot of the physical comedy will hit all ages, but I think, you know, the writing is very witty. The puns and double entendres ought to play for a grown-up audience while the kids sit there and go, oh my gosh, look, there's a moose and a squirrel running around and these weird cartoon characters are now people. Um, it, you know, it should deliver on both of those levels. I think it's for both kids and adults and and that's, that's, it's great. I did Buddy and that was for kids and I really enjoyed doing that. And so now I've got two films that my daughter can go and see, so I love that. I think they can expect a wonderful all-family property with a tremendous amount of humor. And the adults certainly will feel that, you know, baby boomer nostalgia pull back to their childhood when they watched Rocky and Bullwinkle. And their kids are already watching it. It's been on Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network. So I'm hoping that it's just a delightful all-family comedy that everybody enjoys. Well, it's been great. Had to bring Rock out of the old squirrel retirement home where he's been gathering nuts for the last 36 years. But Rock has a little bit of trouble remembering how to fly. Now that's all we're gonna tell you, but Rock and I suddenly end up just like in the old days. We live again.